International Women's Day is an important moment to reflect on women's achievements and issues which affect women around the world. It's especially suitable that the subject of this year's lecture is the Member of Parliament, Ellen Wilkinson. As 76 years ago, she spoke at the first celebration of International Women's Day to be held in London. It was held in St Pancras Town Hall in 1938. It worked. We've got a press cutting, a press cutting there. And in that lecture, she spoke about the plight of women in Spain. Ellen Wilkinson first became interested in politics as a teenager, and we are very pleased to have here tonight young women from three schools in Leeds. You might want to wave at this point if you're from Leeds. Hello. <laughs> Which are participating in the mentoring project Connecting Enterprising Women. Their mentors are successful women drawn from commerce and the public sector, including seven parliamentarians. Some of those women are also here this evening, and I would like to say that you are especially welcome here to Parliament. The Works of Art Committee was very pleased to be able to select the Connecting Enterprising Women exhibition, Portraits and Stories from Yorkshire, as our Women's History Month exhibition, and it's on display just downstairs here in Portcullis House. If you'd like to see that exhibition, and I've had a look at it already and I can tell you it's well worth seeing, um, there will be an opportunity at the end of the evening. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of those involved with the Connecting Enterprising Women, including Leeds City Council and Leeds University, for their exhibition. Now, without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker. And she is somebody that I can say, from the point of view of my party, is uh, one of the women uh, who has achieved a great deal and someone to whom uh, relative newcomers to Parliament, like myself, look up to with great admiration. She is Joyce Quinn, the Right Honourable Baroness Quinn. Like Ellen Wink Wilkinson, Joyce Quinn was an MP for a constituency in the North East. Uh, if I remember correctly, Gateshead East and Washington West, there we go. Um, and uh, before that, she represented the North East as an MEP. She became a life peer in 2006. And I speak on behalf of the whole of the Speakers Committee on Works of Art when I say we are delighted she has agreed to give the introductory, introductory talk to this year's letter, lecture. Baroness Quinn. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Alison, for that, that very generous introduction. And it's a great pleasure to be with you this evening uh, to take part in this event, which is part of International Women's Day's celebrations. And it's also a particular pleasure because the focus of tonight's event is uh, uh, on a political heroine of mine, uh, Ellen Wilkinson, and I think probably a political heroine of quite a number of people in this audience this evening. I have to apologise because I'm one of the people that Alison referred to who may have to go off and vote at uh, some point during our proceedings. I hope that doesn't happen, but if it does, my apologies in advance. Last year, my parliamentary colleague and friend, Joan Ruddock, uh, fulfilled this particular introductory slot in the proceedings. And her reflections then on women in parliament and her feelings about parliament, what parliament was like, were ones that I, I very much agreed with and empathised with. Uh, Joan and I became members of the House of Commons at the same time in 1987, when the percentage of women MPs was a very lowly 6%. Prior to entering parliament, I had, as Alison has said, been a member of the European Parliament. And uh, whatever our various views might be about the European Union, I think there is no doubt that the European Parliament, in its first directly elected form in 1979, uh, perhaps in common with newer assemblies, uh, such as the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Assembly, was a much more women-friendly and equal opportunities place than was the House of Commons when I arrived in, in 1987. 
Um, certainly when I arrived, I was struck forcibly by the difference between the European Parliament and the House of Commons. And uh, I very well remember that on my first day, three things illustrated that very vividly. The first was uh, when you come into the members' cloakroom in, in the House of Commons, there is a pink ribbon attached uh, to your coat hanger, and that's apparently a ribbon where you can hang your sword for convenience. And that, of course, taught me two things immediately about the House of Commons. First, that it's been around for a long time, so there is a, a, a tradition there, uh, which is often positive. Uh, but it also taught me that it was uh, a very masculine tradition, uh, uh, institution because even in the days of sword bearing, I don't think many women carried swords. <laughs> then I remember also going round the building with a, a friend of mine, a, a, a colleague who'd been like me, a member of the European Parliament, a male colleague, and we thought we'd walk around the building and try and familiarise ourselves with it. And as we walked around, the attendants kept saying, good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. This happened on every occasion, and I suddenly realised that I was being regarded as some kind of appendage rather than a member of Parliament in my own right. And finally, the, 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 I then went to what we call the vote office, where you pick up uh, uh, copies of the orders of the day, and I asked for two copies because I wanted to send one home to my constituency office. And I was then uh, confronted with the question, why do you want two copies? How many members do you work for? <laughs> so that uh, shows, in a way, what the atmosphere was like when, when, I, first, uh, when I first arrived. And it certainly was a, a culture shock coming from the European Parliament, and a culture shock which I think convinced me of the need of a, a culture change uh, in uh, the institution which I'd just become part of. Obviously, there has been a lot of progress since then, and the step change certainly occurred with the election of over 100 Labour women MPs in 1997. Certainly, I felt that the place looked and felt differently as a result of that, uh, and it's never gone uh, back uh, to exactly how it was uh, before. But I agree with what Joan Ruddock said in her talk last year, that there is still a long way to go. Uh, and given that we have a, a large number of uh, young women from the north of England, I'm glad to say, uh, I'd certainly like to encourage them to look at parliamentary careers as well as other careers for their, for their future. We have a long way to go. The gender gap is still there. And the international comparisons are not terribly good. For example, in the European Union, we are 15th out of 28 in terms of the proportion of women MPs. And in the International Parliamentary Union's 2013 report, uh, we are 65th out of 190. So we could do better, particularly given our long-standing <coughs> democratic credentials. Uh, given that I'm now in the House of Lords, I should also refer to that uh, in this context. The House of Lords has a similar percentage of women members, as is the case for the House of Commons, some 23%. But there are some bright spots. The first two speakers of the House of Lords have both been women, uh, and of recent leaders in the House of Lords, uh, four out of five have been women, um, uh, and prominent women at that, Baroness Jay, uh, Lady Amos, who now has a very senior role in the United Nations, uh, and Cathy Ashton, who is the high representative in the European Union, uh, and Jan Royal, the uh, uh, current leader of the opposition in the House of Lords, who's recently been voted Peer of the Year, I'm, I'm glad to say. While further House of Lords reform is somewhat stalled at the present time, uh, and I hope personally it will be given a new impetus in the future, uh, I think it will be, impossible, uh, will be important when we talk about House of Lords reform to think of uh, ensuring that women are strongly represented in a reformed House of Lords, and also that there's a good proportion of members from across the nations and regions, something which is rather imbalanced in the current House of Lords, which, although it has many strengths, uh, also has that regional imbalance weakness, which I think many of us from outside the metropolis would very much like to uh, see rectified. So those are my reflections on, on women in Parliament, in our Parliament here at the present time. But talking of effective women's representation and the need for strong uh, women's representation from the regions as well as metropolitan voices, 
I think makes a very appropriate link to the subject of tonight's event, Ellen Wilkinson. Ellen, as we know, was a very prominent MP in her day, uh, both in opposition in the 1920s and 30s, uh, and then as a wartime coalition minister, and finally as a cabinet minister in the Attlee government at the end of the war. She came from the Northwest, from Manchester, and was strongly attached to her Northwestern roots. But her political career anchored her in the Northeast, in Middlesbrough, first of all, and then later on in the town of Jarrow. As someone brought in, born and brought up on Tyneside, to me, Ellen Wilkinson has always been a very familiar name. And there are, in the Northeast today, many reminders of Ellen and the work that she did. In the constituency that I represented in the House of Commons, there is, for example, the Ellen Wilkinson Housing Estate, which is a, a good quality council estate built uh, just after the Second World War, and uh, whose streets have uh, the names of many prominent Labour pioneers, and indeed, uh, some of the streets are named after Ellen's cabinet colleagues. More recently, in 1997, uh, one of the trains on the Tyneside Rapid uh, Transit System, the Metro System, uh, was named after Ellen. Uh, and that's something that I remember well, because Mo Molum, who represented a part of Teesside, where Ellen had originally had her constituency, was present. And so was I, who represented part of the Jarrow seat. Um, and we were both there to pay tribute to her on that occasion. There are still one or two people in Jarrow who remember Ellen. Uh, last week I was talking to Tom Ellison, who canvassed for Ellen when he was age 17, and who remembers not only how, in his words, well-liked she was, but also how she encouraged people to get together uh, and come together and, and plan and think positively about the future, which was actually a forward-looking and quite brave approach when Jarrow as a town had been so blighted by the recession of the 1930s. Obviously, there are not many people living today who remember Ellen personally like that, and she has no direct descendants, but she does have some living relatives. I'm not sure if Elaine Winterbottom is here today. Yes, yeah, she's raised her hand, but uh, I was delighted that we were able to contact uh, one of, of uh, Ellen's relatives, and I know that she greatly treasures the, the link with Ellen and her great achievements. Uh, Ellen's achievements were many at both uh, national level and at local level, and her national achievements should certainly be remembered. But I suppose the most enduring image of her is, in, in people's minds, is firmly linked to her inspirational leadership of the Jarrow March, the Jarrow Crusade in 1936. This was the dramatic hunger march from Jarrow to London at the height of the 1930s depression, at the height of unemployment, poverty, and misery. And at its peak, unemployment in Jarrow was 74%. Uh, and out of a total population of 35,000, no fewer than 23,000 were forced to draw relief, such as it was. In Ellen's own strong words, uh, and in the, the title of the book that she wrote, Jarrow was quite simply the town that was murdered. And she did all in her power to ensure that the highest authorities in the land, including the government of the day, would recognize the plight of the people that she represented. <coughs> in stature, she was diminutive, uh, but she could command a crowd, uh, and she had an arresting and compelling voice, uh, and her distinctive and beautiful red hair ensured her various nicknames, Red Ellen, uh, and also uh, the fiery or the mighty Atom. The Jarrow Crusade showed how a national politician like Ellen could at the same time be totally identified with and committed to the town that she represented. And later on, she was given the freedom of Jarrow, and the citation included the, what I think of as a charming phrase, which was, to you, our borough has been an object of special care. And that was a tribute that I'm sure Ellen treasured above many others. Uh, but if Ellen is inextricably linked with the Jarrow March, at an event such as this, I think we also have to remember how uh, some other aspects of her, which I'm sure that Dr. Bartley will enlarge upon. Uh, she was firstly a committed internationalist, 
Uh, indeed, the, the press clipping that uh, we saw of the first International Women's Day event uh, highlights that. Uh, her commitment to the Republican cause in Spain, where in visits to Spain she incurred some personal danger and, and was very courageous. But she also supported anti-fascist forces in Italy and very early on was very active in speaking out against uh, what was happening in Nazi Germany. Uh, as early as 1933, she published a pamphlet, The Terror in Germany, talking of the appalling measures that the Hitler government was taking against many of its own citizens. And finally, uh, and last but not least, given that it's International uh, Women's Day, Ellen was also here at home a strong feminist, committed to the emancipation, empowerment, and the economic advancement of women. And in her maiden speech, she attacked unemployment benefit rules for penalizing women, criticized the level of widows' pensions, and lambasted the government for failing to extend the vote to women under 30, exclaiming that women with no votes are neglected. 90 years later, her words still ring out to us today. So for all these reasons, I cannot think of any worthier, worthier recipient for us to honor this evening as part of International Women's Day and I very much look forward to Dr. Bartley telling us more about her and giving us the opportunity to fully appreciate and fully celebrate her this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josie. Incredible to think that um, uh, when uh, Alan was in Parliament, uh, as I came to Parliament, that not only um, at the age I was when I came to Parliament 29, not only then would I not have been able to be a Member of Parliament, but I wouldn't have even been able to vote in the election, which is, seems inconceivable, and yet it was such a short time ago. Our main speaker this evening is Dr Paula Bartley. Dr Bartley has been promoting women's history in schools, colleges and universities for many years. She was senior lecturer in history at the University of Wolverhampton before going to live in Hungary for seven years. In 1983, she co-founded the Women in History series for the Cambridge University Press aimed at school students. She co-edited 10 books in the series and co-authored three of them with topics ranging from women in medieval Europe through to women in India and Pakistan. And her sole authored books include The Changing World of Women, Votes for Women, prostitution, reform and prevention, and my favourite, because my mum bought it for me, <laughs> Emmeline Pankhurst. <laughs> in 2012, she won the Elizabeth Longford Award, administered by the Society of Authors to support her research on Ellen Wilkinson. And her biography, which is here, Ellen Wilkinson, From Red Suffrage to Government Minister, was published by Pluto Press, last month, and I'm assuming available in all good bookshops. Um, I'm sure you all, as I have been, are looking forward to this talk greatly, so if you would assist me by putting your hands together for our main speaker this evening, Dr. Paula Bart. I've just got to get used to all of this technology. Um, first of all, I'm delighted to be here this evening to talk about Ellen Wilkinson, who's quite a passion of mine. Thank you very much to Melanie Unwin for inviting me and for Alison for a very generous introduction. Um, as you could see from that slide that Alison put up, 76 years ago, almost to the day, Ellen Wilkinson was the lead speaker at the first International Women's Day celebration to be held in London. 700 people packed into the hall to hear her speak. But who was this woman who drew such a crowd? We've had a little bit of an introduction to her. Certainly in her day, Red Ellen, as she became known, was one of the most famous, certainly the most outspoken, of the British women politicians. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, got it, thank you. She was a feminist and a socialist who was involved in many of the major struggles of the period. For example, she played a significant role in women's suffrage, fought for trade union rights, was active in the general strike, 
campaigned against fascism and imperialism, led that iconic gyro march, and in 1945 became the first female Minister of Education in Attlee's government, so this room is very appropriate. In between, she helped found the League Against Cruel Sports, put forward the first Right to Roam Bill, this was to enable people to walk freely in the countryside, and championed the building of the Channel Tunnel. <laughs> she was only four foot ten, but she punched way above her height, hence some of her nicknames, the Mighty Autumn, the Fiery Particle, and the Pocket Passionara. <laughs> you know who that was after. These names, I believe, capture the spirit of this rebellious, energetic, warm-hearted, and generous woman. From an early age, Ellen Wilkinson's veins flowed with the political blood, and her whole life revolved around campaigns for social justice in one form or another. Her politics stemmed from an intuitive empathy with the poor, the hungry, the weak, and the underprivileged. She had herself experienced them all. Ellen's determination to improve life for those who were deprived and impoverished led her, in 1907, at the age of 16, to join the Independent Labour Party. She also joined the, Fem the, the Fabians, participated in peace movements. This is a photograph of Ellen at the Women's International Peace and Freedom Conference in Switzerland in 1919. She's in the front row, second left. She even helped set up the British Communist Party. Ellen made sure that all her paid jobs reflected her political beliefs. For example, in 1913, age 21, she was appointed paid organiser for the Manchester Suffragist Society. In 1914, she became the first national trade union organiser for women in New Door. It's now Usdor, still alive and still thriving in Manchester. As a leading trade unionist, Ellen met the key people within the Labour Party. This is a photograph of union delegates with Ramsay MacDonald, who was Labour leader at the time. More importantly, her union financed her politics and made it possible for her to become an MP, a job which she held for most of her life. Here you can see her first election poster. In 1924, by now 33 years old, Ellen was elected Labour MP for Middlesbrough East, an iron and steel town in North East England. These are the other New Door sponsored M candidates who were elected as MPs, and you can see Ellen is just at the bottom. I'm going to look briefly at what it was like for Ellen to be in the House of Commons before turning to look at some of her achievements as a Labour politician. So the first question, how did this fiery feminist and socialist cope in the House of Commons. Now, people remark on how few women there are in Parliament today, but when Ellen took her seat, she was the only woman on the Labour benches and one of only four women in the House of Commons. In the early days, Ellen was intensely lonely. There was no other woman on the Labour benches. She said it was like being dropped like a stone into a quiet pond although I don't know how anyone would describe the House of Commons as a quiet pond. As a stylishly dressed woman with her bright red hair and tiny body, Ellen Wilkinson appeared a completely different kind of MP. At first, as you can see here, she had to sit with her feet six inches from the floor because the benches in the House of Commons were too high for her. She solved this by using her briefcase full of letters from constituents as a footstool. Women politicians, Ellen believed, were always faced with a double standard. The male MP, she said, is accepted for the well-intentioned, hard-working mediocrity that he usually is, but the woman member is expected to combine the keen brain of a Susan Lawrence with the gentleness of a Megan Lloyd George, the vivacity of a Lady Astor, the chic of a Cynthia Mosley, and the serious dignity of the Duchess of Athol. As none of us can possibly reach that ideal, she said, we are each accounted as no use in politics. Now, yes, <laughs> what's changed? Women also had to balance their domestic resp responsibilities with their <coughs> parliamentary duties. Not everyone had a rich husband or the independent means to afford domestic help. 
Edith's summer skill, remember Dellen, with a briefcase in one hand and a dozen letters just collected in the other saying, oh, for a wife. If I had a wife, she might have collected these, drafted answers, untyped them. She would help with the women's sections, give a hand with bazaars, and when I got home fagged out, would have ready a delicious meal. It's obviously not a wife like me. <laughs> <laughs> then as now, women were judged by their dress rather than their politics. Nancy Astor and the other two women MPs always dressed soberly in black suits and white blouses, clothes worn for formal business occasions. They didn't want to attract too much attention. Being a woman, they believed, was quite enough to draw comment. Edlin Ellen patently did not agree. She didn't see why she shouldn't dress as she wished. And so in February 1925, she startled the house into murmurs of admiration when she wore a vivid green dress. And you can see the cartoon here. Now, Ellen was annoyed whenever newspapers focused on what she was wearing rather than what she thought, but the press took no notice. Papers continued to comment whenever she bought a new frock or even changed her hairstyle. Nancy Astor, clearly worried that Ellen's dress detracted from what she said, took her aside, talked to her in a motherly fashion, and begged her to dress dull. Ellen took notice of Nancy Astor's words and reverted to the dull black and white dress adopted by other women MPs, much according to one newspaper, to the great disappointment of about 600 honourable members. <laughs> Guess who might that be? This week, the Sunday papers reported that the majority of female ministers have been given smaller rooms than their male colleagues. This inequality is of long standing. For example, in Ellen's early days as an MP, bathroom facilities were very basic for women. All four MPs had to squash into a small dressing room which contained a washstand, a tin basin, a jug of cold water, and a bucket, no questions please, a situation that naturally all the women found intolerable, but about which only Ellen openly complained. And her criticism hit the press, as you can see by this David Lowe cartoon of male MPs cowering in the background away from Ellen's tirade. Uh, the signs read, uh, to the luxury bathroom, men only, to the men's boudoir to the sitting room, men only. Later on, probably due to Ellen's complaints, the female MPs were allocated better facilities. Women weren't forbidden, but they definitely felt unwelcome in certain areas of the house. As a result, the three other female MPs, either because they feared giving offence or perhaps were even intimidated, didn't use the bars, the smoking rooms, or the members' cloakroom. These were seen as male spaces. Ellen, on the other hand, confronted the exclusively masculine culture, largely because she felt that the members' cloakroom is one of those quiet places where a whispered word may sometimes have more effect than an hour speech in the debating chamber. It is true to say that historians often comment on the problems facing women in Parliament, pointing out how tough and unwelcoming the place could be. Very topical question at the moment. Ellen's combative personality had, however, found its natural home in the belligerent and challenging atmosphere of the House of Commons. She may have been in a minority of four, but her character had been forged in rough and tumble politics elsewhere. For example, Ellen's suffrage days, when she had faced hostile crowds, been pelted with rotten fruit, and forced to furnish witty replies to hecklers, prepared her well for the robustious testosterone-charged parliament she now inhabited. She said later that there was one absolutely necessary precaution for any woman who wanted to enjoy public work, and that was to grow a spiritual hide as thick as the elephant's physical one. Ellen certainly appeared fearless. On only her second day in the Commons, she made her first speech. Now, at the time, it was customary for maiden speeches to be inoffensive and devoid of political content. 
but Ellen had little time for this type of convention. In her main speech, this less than demure redhead displayed complete self-possession. In one great sweep of a speech, she put forward the need for votes for women on equal terms as men, advocated increased unemployment benefits, better pensions and factory law reform. The rather male-dominated House of Commons gave her a somewhat patronisingly generous cheer. Undoubtedly, Ellen was a hard-working MP. There was no official job description, probably still isn't, and therefore no limits placed on the amount of work she could take on. The Labour MP's day, she said, started with party meetings, following on to committees, getting through masses of correspondence when and where they could, interviewing delegations and constituents, and in some cases, dashing off to address large demonstrations. In her constituency, Ellen was expected to hold weekly surgeries, speak at local party meetings, visit local schools, factories and businesses, attend local functions, promote the interests of her constituency in Parliament, and be part-time social worker. In her first few weeks, she, as well as all of this, she had to respond to 1,394 letters from people who wanted advice of some sort. In addition, Ellen spoke regularly in the House of Commons, sat on select committees, and presented bills in Parliament. Her union journal, The New Dawn, commented that Behind two dancing eyes, like a brain with the quality of a filing cabinet, stored with precise and authentic details, accurately card indexed. Outcomes file 57, section 3B, heading C or C1, and there you are, the crushing rejoinder that destroys. Her attention to detail was a huge asset in promoting bills in Parliament, but her workload was a recipe for ill health. By January 1929, she was, as she wrote to Nancy Astor, very near the end of my strength. She had contracted a throat infection, which in the days before penicillin was hard to cure. Chest and throat infections, exacerbated by smoking and hard work, plagued Ellen for the rest of her life. Now, undoubtedly, Ellen put a lot into her job, but what exactly were her achievements as an MP? I will just look at a few of them. One of Ellen's first successes was to help gain equal franchise for women on the same terms as men. When Ellen was first elected, only women over 30 were able to vote. How did she, do? How did she achieve this? It wasn't easy. Well, Ellen became friends with the Conservative Nancy Astor here, and together they made a formidable team. The two came from very different ends of the political spectrum and indeed class backgrounds, but both Wilkinson and Astor cared passionately about the rights of women and established links that cut across party lines. Indeed, what is striking is the way in which the two, and indeed women MPs in general, worked closely with feminist groups outside Parliament and became willing to be the parliamentary spokeswomen for feminist reform. Nancy Astor and Ellen Wilkinson were said to share two traits in common, a booming voice and the ability to annoy the male members of the Commons. The two women worked closely together on a number of questions, ranging from the right of women to maintain their nationality on marrying a foreigner through to improvements in prostitution law. In 1928, they succeeded in one of their aims, gaining votes for women over the age of 21. During the bill's debate in the House of Com Commons, one rather old guard Tory expressed fears that an increase in women voters might lead to a female Chancellor of the Exchequer, <laughs> leading Ellen to shout out, why not? <laughs> why not indeed? In matters of gender equality, Wilkinson and Astor tended to vote together, but in terms of economics, there were major differences which newspapers enjoyed reporting. Ellen was a socialist as well as a feminist, and she was never, ever going to be seduced by the irrepressible charm of Nancy Astor into abandoning her left-wing principles. Which leads me to the second achievement of Ellen that I want to talk about, which is how she brought the plight of the working class into the public eye during the 1930s. In 1929, and now in her late 30s, 
Ellen's socialist principles were put to the test. This time, she was no longer alone on the Labour bench, as another eight women had joined her. Um, in the front row, uh, you can see Cynthia Mosley, Ellen, Susan Lawrence, Margaret Bonfield, and uh, young Jenny Lee. At the time, 1929, Labour was experiencing its second minority government. But five months after Labour came to power, the Wall Street crash precipitated a worldwide economic crisis. Banks collapsed. Businesses went bust. Consumer spending plummeted. Currency lost their value. And unemployment rose. Ellen wrote to her friend Leonard Elmhurst, the founder of Dartington Hall, saying, looks like being a difficult world for a bit, doesn't it? Naturally, Ellen knew exactly where to place the blame for this economic catastrophe, the greed of the bankers. In her view, the City of London had loaned money so that it could reap immense profits, but had been, as she said, caught out. This had resulted not just in heavy losses for the banks, but financial difficulties for the rest of Britain. But how were these economic difficulties to be resolved? The Labour government had a choice. It could either cut costs or pump money into the economy. Ellen wanted the government to introduce a living wage, offer cheap credit, and spend its way out of the recession. She believed that the sooner we increase the buying power of the poorer classes, the sooner we will get out of this depression. Indeed, Ellen echoed the current socialist belief that a planned economy was the only real solution to the economic crisis. She advocated public control of the banking system and nationalising utilities, transport and the essential industries. It is time, she insisted, for workers' control. Instead, the Labour government, after a number of very tense cabinet meetings and reports from two commissions, decided on cuts. Ellen was now faced with an awkward problem. How could she balance her principles with the need for party discipline? She chose her principles, and I'll tell you one of the stories, one that is appropriate to International Women's Day. At 4.30 a.m., the people work hard. On July 15th, 1931, after a very long and arduous session, the Minister of Labour, Margaret Bonfield, proposed to disqualify married women from claiming benefits. Ellen vehemently disagreed with her Labour colleague. In her view, it raised the old bad principle of discrimination against women, which the whole women's movement has been fighting against. Her cries remained unheeded. The Labour government passed the proposal on the basis that married women were not genuinely seeking work. The debate on the cuts, as you know, augured the breakup of the Labour government. It eventually collapsed in August 1931. Macdonald resigned as Labour leader and instead became Prime Minister of a Conservative-dominated coalition government. Ellen, as with most Labour MPs, refused to join it. When Parliament met after the summer recess, the newly formed national government cut the pay of all those paid by the state and cut benefits by 10%. At the same time as reducing benefits, the government imposed the family means test. All family income, savings and even possessions were taken into account when deciding benefit levels. Families, it was argued, not the state, should take care of their relatives. When family means testing was imposed, Ellen held, how can you means test someone without any means? It was, she thought, a very mean test. In her view, the unemployed would be the ones who suffered most because it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for an unemployed man to get his benefit. The last few months of 1931 passed quickly for Ellen. In September, Ramsay MacDonald was expelled from the Labour Party and the following month, a general election took place. Here's Ellen's election poster. The national government with MacDonald as leader won a landslide victory 
securing 554 seats, all at the expense of the Labour Party, which won a humiliating 52. It was a crushing defeat, made worse when several leading figures, including Herbert Morrison, Margaret Bonfield, Susan Lawrence, and Ellen Wilkinson, lost their seats. No Labour women were left in Parliament. So the early years of the 1930s were challenging for Ellen Wilkinson. She was now in her 40s and still needed to earn a living. So she resumed full-time work for her union. She lectured, developed her reputation as a writer, and continued to campaign for the causes she held dear. Here she is in 1932 visiting Germany to help the socialists in the German elections. As you know, Hitler came to power. She published a number of books, including The Division Bell Mystery, a murder mystery set in the House of Commons. I don't know whether that was sweet revenge. <laughs> she also co-authored political books, such as Why Fascism? Ellen had a natural journalistic flair and an ability to popularise difficult and contentious issues, such as women's rights. A headline I think that could be used today. Consequently, she contributed regularly to newspapers and journals, such as Time and Tide, the Daily Herald, and even the Daily Mail. But Ellen missed the House of Commons. In 1935, she was once more elected, this time as MP for Jarrow, a former shipbuilding town with one of the worst unemployment records in England. Only 100 out of 8,000 skilled manual workers had work. Here, families were trapped in a vicious circle of low wages, lower benefits, and malnutrition. I loathe poverty, Ellen said. I don't just mean being hard up and having to do without things for a bit. I mean poverty as an institution, the deep, grinding, health-destroying poverty in which people in this country live. Ellen Wilkinson put the plight of her constituency in front of the world by helping to organise the Jarrow Crusade, a hunger march that has become the iconic image of the Hungry Thirties. She had helped in hunger marches before, ones organised by the Unemployed Workers' Movement and led by the Communist Party. But she knew that these marches had been condemned as far-left propaganda, so was determined for the Jarrow March to be different. From the beginning, the crusade was carefully stage managed. Even the choice of the word crusade rather than march is itself significant. The march was kept non-political and known communists were excluded from it. Moreover, all the parties, conservative, labor and liberal, agreed to bury their differences and do what was best for the town. Everyone insisted that it was simply Jarrow asking for work. So on Monday, October the 5th, 1936, the marchers set off to walk to London. They planned to present a petition signed by Jarrow citizens to Stanley Baldwin, now Prime Minister. Ellen encouraged the Jarrow marchers to appear <coughs> as respectable as possible. She knew the importance of creating a positive image. The marchers were carefully shaved, broken boots repaired and polished, shabby clothes brushed and mended, and waterproof capes rolled neatly over their shoulders. All the men wore ties. In her electrifying account of the crusade in that evocatively, provocatively titled book, The Town That Was Murdered, Ellen charted the progress of herself and the men. Each day, the marchers left at 9 a.m., marched for 50 minutes, rested for 10 minutes, then marched again. At noon, here's Ellen in the middle, they ate lunch and in fine weather took a nap on the grass. Each night there was a meeting at which Ellen usually spoke. <coughs> 30 days and 290 miles later, the marchers reached the capital. It was raining. Ellen wearily remarked that we all looked so utterly shabby and weary in our wet clothes that we presented London with a picture of a walking, distressed area. The crusade hit the headlines. Here's Ellen speaking in Hyde Park at the end of the march. Even though neither the Labour Party nor the TUC at the time approved of it, 
Indeed, historians tend to believe that Jaro achieved little of, e of concrete value at the time, but did, however, shape the post-war perceptions of the 1930s as a hungry decade. Ellen helped fight poverty in other ways. Many of her constituents, along with working class people elsewhere, couldn't afford to buy goods outright, and so bought them on credit. But if they missed even their last payment, their goods could be confiscated. In 1937, Ellen brought in a private member's hire purchase bill to stop bruisers, like the man in this cartoon, taking goods by force when people fell on hard times. You can just see Ellen just about to stop a chest of drawers being confiscated and the man saying, what the Ellen, which I think was quite sweet. The bill, the bill eventually became law on New Year's Day 1939. It was the first act to protect consumers. In addition, Ellen continued to promote women's equality. For example, on April the 1st, I don't think it's significant this date, by the way, 1936, Ellen introduced a motion to the House of Commons which would give equal pay to women in the civil service. Ellen's proposal was surprisingly carried. However, the Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, refused to accept the outcome, called for a second vote and asked that it be treated as a vote of confidence. In the next division, the government won and female servants, civil servants, had to wait until 1956 to receive equal pay to men. The irony, I think, of this cartoon is obvious. You can see Ellen standing with her equal pay boxing gloves on, clearly the winner. Baldwin is on the floor, knocked out. But the referee, also Baldwin, declares the winner to be Baldwin. During this period, Ellen also helped form Labour's Labour Party policy towards Republican Spain. This is a photo of Ellen and Clement Attlee inspecting bomb damage in Madrid. She also campaigned for Indian independence and vigorously denounced fascism. In her opinion, fascism meant war. Ellen was the first to report the German invasion of the Rhineland and to comment on it as a dangerous challenge to peace. Not surprisingly, she was a forceful critic of Chamberlain's appeasement policy. When war broke out in September 1939, Ellen agitated to get rid of Chamberlain and replace him with Churchill. Which brings me to the third achievement I want to talk about, Ellen's work in helping make British people safe from bombs in the Second World War. The war gave Ellen the opportunity to advance her political career. Here she is in the government lift, obviously on her way up. When Churchill became Prime Minister, he appointed Ellen to a minor ministerial post in the pensions office. She was only at the ministry for a few months before being moved to work as parliamentary private secretary to Herbert Morrison, now Home Secretary. From 1942 to 1945, she was Morrison's lieutenant in a hard-working and arduous office. The war proved to be a turning point for Ellen Wilkinson. She was now in a position to get things done rather than point out what others ought to be doing. <coughs> Ellen had lived all her political life on the other side of the barricades, always opposing, constantly protesting. But now, as a junior member of government, she had to learn the art of being responsible. At first, her status as a compassionate, radical politician was confirmed. But as the war dragged on, and she abandoned many of the principles she had once held dear, her reputation as a fiery socialist diminished. Naturally, as a junior member of government, Ellen had to compromise her political beliefs and accept the wartime restrictions imposed by the Home Office. At first, Herbert Morrison, well aware of Ellen's popularity among the working class, put her in charge of shelter provision. Immediately, she vowed to keep the population safe and public morale positive, but it was a tough undertaking. Part of her new job was to put to bed each night outside their own homes one million Londoners. You can see someone dreaming that Ellen and Morrison are carrying them away to safety. You can see she was obviously quite popular. Shelter provision was woefully inadequate when Ellen took, older, took over. But within a week, she had instigated a scheme to improve home shelters. 
soon called <coughs> Morrison shelters, which would withstand bombs better. This isn't a very good slide, but you can just see Ellen in the shelter while Morriston stands rather <laughs> elegantly outside. At the beginning of the bombing, Ellen encouraged people to stay in these home shelters, but not everyone had the money to buy one or the space in which to put them. And once heavy bombing began, people wanted somewhere safe and quiet to sleep at night. There were a few communal shelters, but those which existed soon became too crowded, too unsanitary, or too unsafe to use. Others, of course, flocked to the London Underground. In the early days of the war, Ellen spent her time improving conditions in these places. As usual, she threw herself into the challenge. She promised people safety, sanitation, and sleep. A typical Ellen soundbite highlighting people's understandable human urge for all three. She chivied and bullied, encouraged and threatened, ordered and charmed. By the spring of 1941, thanks partly to the efforts of Ellen Wilkinson, people were sheltering in some relative comfort. Bunk beds were installed, chemical lavatories were set up, and ventilation, lighting and running water became available. In some shelters, canteen facilities, night classes, films, and other activities were offered. Despite these shelter improvements, people still got hurt, and many, as we know, were killed. Ellen drove around inspecting air raid shelters immediately after they had been bombed, on her own, often in the dark, and without using headlights. Soon she was dubbed the Shelter Queen. One newspaper commented that Miss Ellen Wilkinson's personal visits to the East End have done more to put heart and courage into families than anything that has gone before. Certainly, Ellen's work contributed to raising public morale and helped create the image of a nation working together against a common enemy. Looking after a vulnerable pop population suited Ellen, but she was now a member of government and had to conform to government policies, or resign. She was severely tested over her role in the fire services. In April 1941, Herbert Morrison restructured the fire services and 1,400 local fire brigades were forced to amalgamate <coughs> down to 32. Ellen's job was to convince firemen to accept the changes, but she faced criticism. She was thought to be the most tactless woman who ever held minor office. When she informed firemen that the new regulations are not meant to be understood by them, they just had to do what they were told. It got worse. On New Year's Eve 1941, Herbert Morrison established compulsory and unpaid fire watching and asked Ellen Wilkinson to oversee it. Trade unions objected. They insisted that fire watchers be paid for their time. Ellen, who in the past might have led the process, endorsed the government's position. Why? Well, in her opinion, the great evil of fascism threatened democracy, and fighting it was more important than protecting the rights of the working class. There was no point in trying to fight for equality in Britain, she argued, if there was no Britain left. The needs of the country had to take priority over trade union demands. And she kept the pressure up, constantly urging fire guards to put in more effort. She once told a fire training conference, you can see the quote in the cartoon, <coughs> that some fire guards think they are just doing their training if they come to their place and play cards or darts. This must stop. More compromise and more criticism followed. For example, strikes and lockouts were banned. Oppressive measures such as these would once have been anathema to Ellen, but now, as a member of government, she was forced to back them. In August 1942, a strike in the northeast was settled when she persuaded the men to resume work. If you want to fight, she told them, fight Hitler. On April 30th, 1945, Hitler committed suicide. A few days later, Germany surrendered and the war officially ended in Europe. No more bombs would be dropped. No more houses destroyed. 
no more families made homeless, no more people killed or injured, and no more need for shelters or fire watchers. Ellen collapsed in a relief fueled exhaustion, but she was left with no time to recuperate as Parliament was dissolved and new elections took place. By now, Ellen was firmly established as a key political figure. She was a senior member of the National Executive and chair of the party. At the time, the NEC supervised policy development and Ellen played a pivotal role, helping to direct strategy and undoubtedly arguing for Labour to be more radical. Which brings me on to the penultimate achievement I want to share with you. I believe that Ellen helped create the post-war Labour Party's philosophy and values. Ellen Wilkinson, Michael Young, Herbert Morrison and Patrick Gordon Walker co-authored the 1945 Labour Party Manifesto, Let Us Face the Future, a document which embodied the thinking of two decades and years of work. I believe that Let Us Face the Future, a passionate, expressive, radical manifesto had Ellen's hands and principles written all over it. The manifesto declared that the Labour Party stands for freedom, for freedom of worship, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. But there are certain so-called freedoms that Labour will not tolerate. Freedom to exploit other people, freedom to pay poor wages and to push up prices for selfish profit. Freedom to deprive the people of the means of living full, happy, healthy lives. Ellen had long argued that to nationalise the banks is to attack the very citadel of capitalist supremacy. So I was delighted when the manifesto declared that the Bank of England must be brought under public ownership. And in an even more radical paragraph, with direct reference to Clause 4 in the Labour Party's former constitution, and in hardly the words of Herbert Morrison, the manifesto stated, the Labour Party is a socialist party. I'm proud of it. Its ultimate purpose at home is the establishment of the socialist commonwealth, free, democratic, efficient, progressive, public spirited, its material resources organised in the services of the British people. The transformation of society that Ellen had worked for all her life now seemed possible. At the 44th Annual Conference of the Labour Party, Ellen presided over the largest Labour Party conference ever held. She was now at the pinnacle of her power, sitting centre stage on the conference platform and delivering a rousing socialist speech. It was, claimed a colleague, Ellen's finest hour. Her union journal proudly commented that no one will ever forget the nerve, the verve, the wit, the confidence and the joyful challenge with which she led the conference from its brilliant opening to its triumphant close. Ellen herself said, this is the proudest moment of my life. And in the usual tradition, the conference ended with singing the red flag and old line sign. Miss Ellen in the middle. Ellen went into the election with her gun full of socialist ammunition, firing round after round of bullets at the Tory party. She was part of a special campaign committee, including Clement Attlee and Herbert Morrison, which directed the election. She wrote, spoke and hectored to as many as she could, reminding each audience of the bitter period of 18 years of interwar Tory rule, promising a new dawn under a Labour government. The Labour Party, as you know, won a sweeping victory. It held to its electoral promise of reform, despite Britain being on the verge of bankruptcy. It created the National Health Service, introduced a more comprehensive system of national insurance, nationalised the Bank of England and other industries, repealed anti-union laws and reformed the education system. Ellen's hopes for her country seemed to have materialised, which leads me to the final achievement I want to share with you, which is Ellen's work in the post-war Labour government. Clement Hatley, the Prime Minister, pencilled in Ellen as Minister of Health, but at her request, apparently, he changed it to Minister of Education. 
And so on August the 3rd, 1945, <coughs> Ellen became the first female Minister of Education, the second woman in Britain to become a cabinet minister and the only woman in a cabinet of 20. Ellen's main task as minister was to implement Butler's 1944 Education Act. As you know, this act set out a controversial tripartite system. It proposed grammar schools for the most intellectually gifted, secondary modern schools for the majority, and technical schools for those with a technical or scientific aptitude. Given her radical past, it was perhaps surprising that Ellen didn't abolish public schools and replace them with comprehensives for all. But abolishing public schools would perhaps have been a step too far for a hard-pressed Labour government keen to change so much else. Indeed, Ellen had to fight hard to implement the reforms she held dear, namely the provision of free school milk and the raising of the school at leaving age to 15. In fact, the Labour cabinet wanted to delay the raising of the school, a school age because it would cost too much and money was tight. But Ellen stood firm in cabinet. She even threatened to whip up support from outside parliament and it was implemented. She also persuaded a reluctant government to pass the 1946 School Milk Act that gave free milk to British school children. It was abolished in 1970. Another of Ellen's educational achievements was to help set up UNESCO. At first, the organisation was called UNICO, an educational and cultural organisation, but Ellen put the science into it. At the founding conference which she chaired, here is a photo of her presiding of it, she suggested that science be included in the title of the organisation because in these days when we are all wondering what the scientists will do to us next, it is important that they should feel they have a responsibility to mankind. The delegates, all too aware that the dropping atom bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki had made science a very topical subject, agreed. And so the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organisation, UNESCO, was born. By now, Ellen's health was deteriorating fast. All her life she had suffered from asthma, bronchitis, influenza and lung infections. During the war, she had been admitted to hospital at least seven times. Exhausted by the war effort, her health was undermined further by the demands of her new post. One of her last public engagements was opening with Laurence Olivier, the Old Vic Theatre School. The school building had been bombed and at the time of opening on January the 24th, still had no roof. Ellen caught pneumonia and a few weeks later, on February the 6th, 1947, she died in a private ward at St Mary's Hospital, Pannington. There were fears that she had taken her own life. So to conclude, what was Ellen Wilkinson's legacy? Well, I like this picture. It is certainly impressive in its scope and depth. Throughout her life, Ellen was involved in so many of the important left-wing and feminist issues of the day. Certainly very different groups of people had reason to be grateful to her. I've mentioned young women who benefited from equal franchise, her Jarrow constituents for alleviating unemployment, borrowers who bought goods on hire purchase, wartime city dwellers for keeping them safe from bombs. Everyone save the bankers had reason to thank Ellen for trying to safeguard their economic rights. In addition, the post-war generation were indebted to her for helping to shape the Labour programme for social economic and cultural change. However, the key lesson Ellen teaches is not anything as specific as a list. Instead, it shows us the need for political engagement, compassion, energy, concern and courage, freshened with a dash of utopian thinking. She did, I believe, encapsulate the spirit of 45. Thank you.